Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel, chapter 8, verses 4 through 20. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as the other nations have. But what they said, give us a king to lead us. This displeased Daniel, so he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will come as he is right. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as he reigns his rights. He will take your son and make him serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkey he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of his flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Chairman. Can you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that it speaks into our lives and shapes and changes us. We thank you for your spirit that so inspired this word and faithfully carried it to us today and is here among us even now. And we pray by that same spirit, you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we might receive you and receive you well. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a basic human need to leave our names on things. Some people put their names on buildings or monuments. Some put it on their artwork, but most artists whose work that we read or listen to or look at sign their names on it somehow, even if it's somewhere small and out of the way. From the hieroglyphics on the Egyptian tombs to the credits that scroll after the movie finishes, we put our names on the things that we proudly accomplish. And we get this satisfying feeling looking back on something that we made or that we did and we strive to stay in that feeling and being pleased with our work. Those who can teach others to work like them can accomplish much more than they could ever do on their own. One brick on its own might be able to prop open a door, and really a pile of bricks is maybe even less useful than that, but when they are aligned correctly, they can become a wall that protects a house. They can be built into anything. And the same applies to people. When they align, they can do anything. But it requires leaders who can see beyond their own work 
and see the bigger picture, and then communicate that with everyone about how they fit together. And it's always feels easier to do the work ourselves, and it's often truly easier to just not deal with other people. However, it is never the better option to do it alone. Teamwork is essential, but it only happens with leaders who can shift the focus away from their own work and raise up leaders under them. We do our best to listen to God and to follow where he leads us. We do our best to bring others with us as we go. And as we go, Jesus calls us to patiently lead those who do not yet follow him themselves yet. The most of Samuel's life takes place in just five chapters of the two books of the Bible that bear his name. From being a young boy in chapter 3 to becoming an older man in chapter 8, he led Israel as a prophet, a priest, and a judge, and he experienced a fair amount of success. However, he did not raise up a replacement for himself. Instead, he expected his sons would take over in his place. Unfortunately, his sons did not have his calling or his character. And even if they did, the roles of prophet and judge were not passed down to the family line. Those were selections that were made by God himself. So Samuel should not have been surprised when the elders of the people gathered and they told him that if leadership was going to be passed down through family lines, they wanted to do it like the other nations. And they wanted to do it with a family that had better leaders than his own. Ouch. That's a, that was a harsh rejection. Samuel could get the people to follow him as he followed God. But they could not follow God on their own after he was gone. They were still lost, and they knew it. They wanted a leader who would give them the safety and the security they could trust. And they thought that they would be better off with a warrior king like the other nations had. They wanted a young man, strong enough to lead their men into victory against any of their neighboring enemies. Now Samuel was one of Israel's greatest leaders. He was right there with Moses. But even Samuel could not change the hearts of the people. No matter how much he pleaded with them. Because we want what we want. No matter how great our leaders may be, they cannot change what we want. Even Jesus had people who walked away from him because they either had too many possessions, too many duties, too many cares for the world. And Jesus would not compete with those other desires. He tells us the truth, and then he leaves us the choice to believe the lie and follow our hearts all the way to destruction. Because we want what we want. But we need what we need. The people needed God, not a broken, sinful human being to be there. And Samuel knew it. He knew how to let God be in charge, and no one else understood that. Samuel's own children didn't understand that. But Samuel did, or at least he thought he did. And this moment in Samuel's life is an excellent example of how our allegiance to God can so easily slip away. No matter how often Samuel told the people it was God who delivered them, many believe that it was mostly Samuel leading the way, or that God delivered them ultimately by giving them Samuel to lead, and then God went back up to heaven to take a nap for a few decades while Samuel was running the place. And to this day, we as God's people, who had Jesus come to us in the flesh, and 2,000 years of the Holy Spirit moving and saving people all over the world, in every nation, filled with both righteous and wicked leaders, we still have a sense that our safety and security and well-being depend on getting the right leaders selected. We forget that no matter who sits on the throne, whether there even is a throne, whether we're at home, in our own country, in our own culture, or whether we're sent overseas to the ends of the earth to live under the authority of pagans, atheists, or leaders who persecute Christians, no matter what our circumstances may be today, it is God, the one and only, who leads us, provides for us, protects us, and makes us who we are. And the truth is, I can stand up here and say this today, Come November, 
our blood pressure will run a little higher. We will find ourselves saying the same things and praying the same kind of prayers that the people brought to St. Paul. We still struggle to believe that God is truly and fully in charge of our lives. So we should not be surprised when the people we are trying to lead, we're trying to lead them to serve God with us, keep falling back and trusting in their own strength rather than God's. Or even more often, trusting in us to carry them through the day rather than seeing the many ways that God is carrying us as we need them. In the end, the only one that we need is Jesus. Everything and everyone else in our lives are extra blessings that Jesus sometimes works through and often works despite. If we were more faithful people as a whole, we wouldn't need leaders at all. We would all just follow Jesus. But we all struggle with doubts and confusion. So God calls us to lead each other lovingly back to Him. What we want is not always what we need. But what do we get? As Samuel was telling everyone what they really needed, God stopped him and told him to just let go and give the control back to God. Let them have their way. Let them have their forbidden fruit and tell them what the consequences will be. Tell them the king will be everything that they wanted and he will take everything that they have. And one day he will fail them and they will all fall away. All because they traded God, whom they could not see, for a man that they made into an idol to follow. And tell them on that day you will cry out that you changed your mind, you didn't mean it, when you asked for this leader, instead of following God. But on this day, God won't hear you. God gave them a man who would become an idol, not a leader. God gave them a man known for his size and strength and good looks, not for his faithfulness in following God. And they would suffer the consequences of their choices, feeling like God was not listening to them until he sent them the Savior they truly needed, not the leader they wanted. And that's what we get. Leaders who lead us to follow Jesus with love. I'm not talking about evangelism, which is introducing people to Jesus for the first time, although that is a kind of leadership. I'm talking about being a parent, being a guardian, being a teacher, a team leader, or even a good neighbor in your community that others respect and follow. As a mom or dad, your job is not done once you introduce your children to Jesus. You don't drop your kids off at church, walk away, and never see them again. You keep bringing them to Jesus over and over until they start trusting in Jesus themselves. And even then, you don't stop leading them. You keep watch. You check in with them. And you're there to catch them and lead them back to Him if ever they face doubts or struggles. God gives us and calls us to be leaders who lead with His love. In the Bible, love's description begins with patience and it ends with perseverance, both in Paul's words and in the life of Jesus. You can check that out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Patience and perseverance are the bass drums of the rhythm of our dance with God. And they're the bass notes that hold up everything else in the symphony of our love that we share with others. If you're leading faithfully, it will usually feel like you're failing. Your children, family, co-workers, and teammates, your neighbors and friends, they will frustrate you as God calls them to lead them. They won't get it at first, and they will fall back often. You won't feel in control. You'll begin to see how difficult it was for Jesus as he marched to the cross, just begging his disciples to see and hear one another and love each other well. And to know that they had such a long way to go as he stretched out his arm on that cross. You'll feel his pain as his heart breaks for us. And then you'll see that he also has a cross for you, as he calls you onward to lead like him. 
And when they reject you, you can hear the voice of God as he told Samuel, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their faith. As they have done from the day I brought them up from Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them claims his rights. You cannot make anyone follow Jesus. Because Jesus did not make anyone follow him. But you can follow Jesus' example, and you can lead them with patience and persevering love until they choose to follow him instead of merely following you. And in the end, it will not be your name that is praised and memorialized, nor will it be the names of those that you led to do their work with you faithfully. It will only be Jesus, the name above all names, that we remember and praise as we all find our true identity in him. Brothers and sisters, who do you lead? Who do you see as lost sheep, scattered and left without a shepherd to guide them to green pastures and still waters? Who is God calling you to step up and lead today? And who are you struggling to lead? Where do you feel your patience being tested the most? Are these some of the same people God is calling you to lead to Him and to keep close to Him throughout their doubts and struggles? And when you think about your own walk with Jesus, how do your struggles to follow him faithfully help remind you of the patient love you need to leave those placed in your care? Would you pray with me? Lord, we need you more than we know. We want our families to be taken care of, our nation to be secure, our work to be prosperous, and our church to feel alive and young and healthy and growing. But we don't want to step up and lead it to be that way because we don't feel secure, prosperous, young, and healthy, and growing ourselves most days. We feel other feelings instead, and we don't want to lead others to feel that way. Today, Lord, we are not asking you to send us good leaders. Instead, we are asking you to give us the patience and persistent love that comes from your Holy Spirit to help us to be those leaders that our families, our workplaces, our nation, and our church need. We know it's easier to do the work ourselves, but help us to not to focus on how we will lead our mark in this world, but instead to lead your mark on anyone and everyone that you bring to us as we lead them to you. In Jesus' name, amen.